All right, good afternoon, everyone. I am Council Member Rafael Salamanca, Chair of the Subcommittee on Planning, Dispositions, and Concessions. Welcome, everyone, to today's hearing. Uh, today, we're joined by um, Council Member Andrew Cohen, Council Member Mark Traeger, and Speaker Melissa Mark Verrito. Today, we'll vote on the 126th Street bus application, which we, we heard on August 21st, and we will hold public hearings on two additional applications. LU 742, Small Homes Rehab, will be laid over. The 126th Street Bus Depot development has four related applications, mm -hmm. LU 733, 734, 735, and 736. EDC <coughs> seeks approval of a zoning map change, a zoning tax amendment, a city map change, and a future disposition of city-owned property to facilitate the redevelopment of the 126th Street MTA Bus Depot into a mixed-use project that includes the Harlem African Burial Ground Memorial. This project is expected to result in the development of over 700 apartments, approximately 300,000 square feet of commercial space, and new open space and indoor memorial. In order to finance the memorial, some market rate units are needed, but the administration has committed to ensuring that no more than 20% of the project will be market rate and that 80% of the housing will be affordable with at least 20% of the project at 30% AMI. Given the difficulty history of the site, I want to commend and congratulate the speaker, the East Harlem Burial Ground Task Force, and EDC for coming together to create a shared vision. And with that, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So good afternoon uh, to all my colleagues. The project being voted on today is the culmination of almost a decade of work. Reverend Patricia Singletary from the Elmendorf Reformed Church approached my office in 2009 with a mission to properly memorialize her church's historic African burial ground underneath the 126th Street bus depot, which had been forgotten, built upon, and disrespected for almost 200 years. We embraced the cause and formed a group of local stakeholders with her to advocate for the reclamation, the reclamation preservation, and recognition of this sacred cemetery. I want to recognize the tremendous work that has been done by Reverend Singletary and members of the Harlem African Burial Ground Task Force to persevere when no one believed the history that they had uncovered. I'd also like to thank EDC staff for their patience and attentiveness to community concerns, as well as Community Board 11, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, members of the subcommittee, and others, particularly the staff here at the City Council, my staff in the district office, uh, and the land use staff as well, for their efforts in shaping this project in a way that affirms our history and is responsive to the present and future needs of the community. This application has been particularly challenging as an RFP has not yet been released, and thus there is not a specific developer at the table. However, we worked with EDC and the administration to develop a thorough points of agreement document that codifies specific commitments and community benefits while still allowing enough flexibility for creativity among RFP respondents. I am pleased that the city has committed to a process of ongoing engagement with the ha Harlem African Burial Ground Task Force leadership and Community Board 11 throughout the RFP process. First and foremost, this project delivers an outdoor memorial, an indoor cultural educational center that will recognize and celebrate the Harlem African Burial Ground as an important part of the city's cultural heritage. To that end, the council is modifying the application to ensure that 18,000 square feet of publicly accessible open space will be located on the historic footprint of the burial ground. Additionally, we have agreed on a financial framework that will enable the outdoor memorial and cultural educational center to be constructed and maintained in perpetuity. The administration has agreed to work with the developer to identify funding resources for pre-development and construction. Further, the developer will be required to provide an annual contribution of approximately $1 million to support eligible operating costs. The indoor and outdoor spaces will be provided to the memorial operator free of charge. The commitments being made today, made today will ensure the, historic, the history that Reverend Singletary and the task force have rediscovered will never be forgotten again. As mentioned by the chair, the project will also deliver over 700 units of housing, the majority of which will be affordable housing and will target lower AMI tiers. The administration has committed that 50% of units will be affordable at or below 60% of AMI, with at least 20% of units affordable at 30% of AMI, or 25,770 in annual household income. The Council is modifying the zoning text amendment to eliminate MIH option 2 from the rezoning area and apply the deep affordability option. 
The administration has agreed that no more than 20% of units will be market rate, which will be needed to cross-subsidize the financial commitments to the memorial's operations. The project will also include a mix of office, commercial, and retail uses. The retail component has been capped at no more than 138,000 square feet. Finally, the project will, be, will advance quality of life concerns, including provisions around local hiring, pedestrian safety, and streetscape improvements. The developer will be required to contribute to support job training and local outreach efforts. EDC will also require the developer to create a targeted hiring outreach plan and utilize their best efforts to meet local hiring goals. Again, I want to commend the Harlem African Burial Ground Task Force, EDC, and the staff here at the council and land use in particular for their hard work and shared vision and encourage my colleagues to support this project. Thank you, Madam Speaker. As the speaker noted, we will be voting on modifications to require at least 18,000 square feet of outdoor memorial space and to restrict the MIH program to the lower AMI options, option one and option three. Council, please call the roll on a vote to approve with modifications LU 733, 734, 735, and 736. Chair Salamanca. Aye. Councilmember Cohen. Aye. Councilmember Traeger. With congratulations to the speaker, I vote aye. By a vote of three in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and zero abstentions, the item is recommended for approval with modifications and referred to the full land use committee. Awesome. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And now we will move on to our public hearings. So the first hearing item is LU 738, the Caton Flats application. This application is for a tax exemption pursuant to an Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law. This approval will facilitate a 14-story building that includes 255 affordable residential units, a commercial unit, community facility spaces, and 68 parking spaces. The community facility and commercial spaces consist of Flatbush Caton Market, Food Incubator, and Office Space for Caribbean, American, Chamber of Commerce, and Industry. The development is located in Councilmember Eugene's District in Brooklyn. I am now opening up the public hearing on LU 738, the Caton Flats application. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. My name is Jordan Press from HPD's Government Affairs Unit. Land use number 738 consists of pro uh, proposed Article 11 tax benefits for an exemption area known as Caton Flats, lo located at 794 Flatbush Avenue in Brooklyn Council District 40. On April 25th, the Council approved the Flatbush Caton Market ULERP, which includes the rezoning, establishment of an MIH area, and conveyance of 794 Flatbush Avenue through, ec through the Economic Development Corporation's disposition process to the sponsor. Uh, BRP Development Corporation as a mixed-use, mixed-income development. As part of the project, a newly constructed building will consist of 14 stories with 255 residential rental units, a commercial unit, community facility space, and 68 parking spaces that will be developed under HPD's mixed-income program, the M-squared program. The unit breakdown of the residential portion is anticipated to be 64 studios, 87 one-bedroom, 64 two-bedrooms, and 43-bedroom apartments, including a superintendent unit. 27 of the units will be affordable to households earning at or below 40% of AMI, with rent set at 37% of AMI. 27 units will be affordable to households earning at or below 60% of AMI, with rent set at 57% of AMI. 38 units will be affordable to households earning at or below 90% of AMI with rent set at 80% of AMI. 38 units will be affordable to households earning at or below 110% of AMI with rent set at 90% of AMI. And the balance of the residential units, 124 of them, will have rent set at 130% of AMI. I should clarify that uh, these numbers are consistent uh, entirely with what was agreed to at the time of the ULERP. Uh, passage earlier this year. The community facility spaces consist of Flatbush, the Flatbush Caton Market, Food Incubator and Office Space for the Caribbean American Chamber of Commerce and Industry, or CACI. Currently, HPD is before the Planning Subcommittee seeking Article 11 tax benefits in order to facilitate affordability for the residential units as well as the community facility space for a term of 40 years coinciding with the regulatory agreement. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Press, um, in regards to the um, the vendors, I know that there was an agreement 
where the vendors were going to be moved to another location, right. not too far yep. from there, while the construction was happening, and That's they right. were going to be moved back. Uh, where are we with that? Um, my understanding, uh, again, HPD is is just doing the uh, residential financing, but my understanding is that the developer is um, prepared to initiate the uh, the transfer of the vendors from the current location to the new location, um, and they they want to just have all of the financing, including passage of the Article 11, locked up before taking on that expense. But right. they, the site the site the, the the site has been agreed to, and they are uh, prepared to move them shortly. And this site is city land. The current site is city land. That's right. City land. All right. Any questions? You have any questions? Last one. All right. So, are there any other members in the public who wish to testify? I see none. I am now closing uh, the public hearing on LU seven three eight. The second hearing item is LU 746, the NCP Park and Elton Apartments application. This application is for an amendment of a previously approved urban development action area project to approve the disposition of property located at 3120 Park Avenue and 451 East 159th Street in my council district in the Bronx. This application also requests approval of a tax exemption pursuant to Article 11 of the private housing finance law to facilitate the development of 38 affordable housing units. I am now opening up the public hearing on LU746, the Park and Elton Apartments application. Good afternoon. Again, my name is Jordan Press from HPD's Government Affairs Unit. I'm uh, joined by a Andrea Kretschmer from Zenolith, the, uh, the developer who would also like to give some remarks and answer any questions you have about the project. Land use number 746 consists of two city-owned vacant lots located at 3120 Park Avenue and 451 East 159th Street in Bronx Council District 17. These two lots are designated urban renewal sites within the Melrose Commons urban renewal area and previous to today's council hearing were included in a ULERP action approved by the City Council on June 27, 2007 for new construction. The 2007 project approved the disposition, UDAP designation and project approval for five sites that were developed through, that were to be developed through HPD's new foundations program. Three of the original parcels have been conveyed and were developed by the selected sponsor as low income rental housing. However, the two lots under land use number 746 remain city owned. Currently, 3120 Park Avenue and 451 East 159th Street are proposed for development under HPD's NCP program, and upon construction completion, a total of 38 units of rental housing will be provided across the two buildings. There will be no commercial uh, or community facility space in this project. There will be a mixture of unit types, including studios, one- and two-bedroom apartments, with household incomes between 80 and 110 percent of AMI, and therefore rents will range from 1,078 to 1,221 for a studio, and 1,642 to 1,857 for a two-bedroom unit. Today, HPD is before the Planning Subcommittee seeking to amend the project summary changing from new foundations to the NCP or Neighborhood Construction Program and to also seek Article 11 tax benefits for the 3120 Park Avenue and 451 East 159th Street lots, which will assist with maintaining affordability for these rental units. The tax exemption will be in place for a term of 40 years coinciding with the length of the regulatory agreement. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, please. Is that on? Okay, good. So um, I'd like to just mention a couple things about the project. It has a history that goes back, as you see, 10 years. So in 2007, the sites, all five sites, were awarded to POCO Partners. And um, they were originally, the new foundation's program was ho affordable home ownership. And so when that program was discontinued, or the, the concept of affordable home ownership uh, after the recession or during that time, the, um, HPD stopped financing those problems, and so the program, the project in particular, was converted to rentals instead of home ownership. And POCO developed the first three of the five lots. Those were the low-income lots. There were 37 units that were developed there. 
um, my partner Terry Belkus Mitchell and I started working at Poco. I went there in 2011, and Terry joined in 2012. And we didn't happen to work on that first phase of this project. Um, since that time, the founder of Poco Partners became very ill, and they were no longer in the development business. And so when Terry and I moved over and started our own enterprise as a woman-owned business, we were able to um, work with the principals at POCO for the opportunity to develop these two sites, the last two of those sites in particular. The plan was always for the project to be mixed income. That was a new foundation's mandate. And so while well, the first three parcels were the low income, the remaining two would be the middle income. Um, just a couple of other things um, to point out. the. Um, because the project is located on two different sites and they're in two different community boards, um, we had the pleasure of presenting to the Land Use and Housing Committee of CB1 and CB3 and had a very positive experience there. We had unanimous support from their committees um, and then from the community board at large for the development of the project. And to note also that because there are two buildings, um, it's the um, per unit costs are slightly higher than you would have if you were building 38 units just on one site alone. So two foundations, two roofs, two building-wide systems, boilers, um, windows, all of that. Um, we are working with OER, the Mayor's Office of Environmental Remediation right now. The sites are e-designated, mostly for noise. So we're working with them on sound attenuation, um, particularly on Park Avenue and um, some of the brownfield remediation fund, some of the grant money for investigation and cleanup. Awesome, thank you. Sure. So I know that we've met uh, in the past, and I did follow the email trail. Um, I, I'm a big proponent of mixed income. Every project that comes to my council district, um, I, I try to get a good mix of incomes. My my uh, my concern here is that the AMIs on this particular project are too high for my community. Um, you know, there's concerns uh, as I'm door knocking, as I'm speaking to my constituents in terms of housing and if housing is truly affordable to them. Um, again, I ensure that I have units for my low income families and my working class families. Um, but I think that 37 units between 80 to 90% AMI are, are, is too high for what my community represents. Mm -hmm. And so I'm willing to work with you mm -hmm. uh, to see how we can go deeper in affordability mm -hmm. in this project. Mm -hmm. One of the challenges of doing that is the way HPD's term sheets are structured, which um, means that, the, well, the new construction program is not a tax credit program, so typically the lower AMI units are financed with the low-income housing tax credits, and because of the size of the job, um, those tax credits don't work here, and if we lower the AMI below the 80% number, it's going to require additional subsidy that at the moment, of course, proves it, provides a challenge for HPD on their end. Um, the, the, the goal, we see these RFPs all the time, and of course this was one many years ago, but staying within the term sheet is a big deal. And that's been the goal of the development team and also, of course, our project managers at HPD. So the, um, the thinking has also been that because this was one, it was seen originally and still is as five lots in one project, but two phases that those lower income units, which are at 40 to 60% of AMI on phase one, that those addressed that need. We'll, we'll certainly look forward to, you know, speaking with your office more about this. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what changed? Because originally, when this project was approved, there were 16 units. And now you've right. increased your unit size right. to 37. Right. The unit count's gone up because HPD and city planning have been through two, two design revisions to the code that say that the preferred unit sizes are changing over time. So the they're making apartments smaller. They're making so, apartments. And I understand they're, they're trying to, they want to create more units. But my confusion is, is in the uh, first version of 16 units, 
you were at a 60% AMI. That was, and now you're increasing, you're doubling the size of your units, and the, the lowest level of AMI is 80%. I, so you're increasing right. your unit size. Right, I hear what you're saying. You're, you're saying we have more units and we're increasing the AMI. Yes. So when so since Xenolith was the designated developer, the AMI has always been 80 to 110 percent. So um, and actually HPD mentioned to me earlier that there was a 2013 discussion about lower AMI, but when we got involved in 2016, we were instructed specifically. That, that we needed to be in the middle income range. So as Jordan mentioned, we'd be happy to go back and look at it again. But um, the size of the units and the unit count, those are reflections of the design standards at city planning. Um, and HPD's goal is always to maximize unit count. Of course, they want to be respectful and habitable units. We're not saying people should live in substandard apartments, but these are what the city has determined are the proper unit sizes now. Can you give me a description of your unit sizes? Um, how many units or studios, one tool? Sure, we're the, the, according to, yep, it's on the third page. So we're, right now, we're at 14 studios, five ones, and four twos, and then the super also gets a two bedroom unit. I'm, I'm sorry, can you oh, repeat sure. that? 14 studios. Okay, so the, um, this is the total, sorry. I was doing the second building first. Well, that building, let's finish that one. So that's on Elton. That's the 451 East 159th. So okay. this is the bigger building. So, so it's 14, 14 studios, studios. Okay. five ones, uh -huh. four twos, and then the super for both building is both buildings is also in that building. So that's another two bedroom. And then on Park Avenue, there are four studios, five ones and five twos. And what are the unit sizes, the square footage? Oh, I don't have them in front of me, Terry. Do you know them? We yeah, we'll, we'll have to look. We'll get back to you on it. Up. Yeah. Jordan, when the new term she's changed, did you dis uh, were there's also uh, were the unit sizes decreased in, the, in as part of the term sheets? Uh, no, the design what we call our design guidelines mm -hmm. um, changed early m much earlier this year, maybe last year. So m they they happened at different times. There so was a change, but it happened at different times. So, in terms of the design guidelines, how much was the decrease? Uh, let's say studio apartment, yeah, one bedroom, I'd, and two bedrooms. I'd need to pull it so I can get that information back to you. But let me just say, uh, collectively, that the change in the design guidelines for uh, slightly smaller units in ter and the change in the term sheets to increase the subsidy and to target more units at lower AMIs collectively were designed to fulfill the Housing New York vision of getting more units built at lower AMIs. All right. Do you have any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Thank you, Chair. I, I'm just curious uh, if HPD has data on the average AMI of the community board or of, of that area. Yeah, we do. I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry I don't have it with me, but I, I have it. 20, it's 24,500. So, Chair, if I'm correct, that is not reaching the average AMI according to what we're hearing so far from, uh, from this application. Is that correct? So, I... I we always defer, uh, obviously, to the local member, especially to our chair, who's really championed uh, the, the issue and the cause of affordable housing, definitely in his community. And I, I would, it seems that the ranges are really out of whack with regard to the average AMI of, of, of his community board. And so I just want to echo uh, the, the, the concerns and comments of my colleague that I think it's important that HPD and, and, the, and the applicants sit down with mm -hmm. the local council member and really mm -hmm. work out a plan that uh, meets the needs of the community. Look, I, I, I'm all for uh, workforce housing as well, uh, but I do believe we need to strike a balance that at mm -hmm. least meets the needs mm -hmm. of the immediate community and, mm -hmm. and create ranges that kind of address mm -hmm. a wide universe. So I just want to uh, make sure that the chair, you know you have my full support on this. Thank you, council member. All right, are there any more statements? Um, are there any more members of the public who wish to testify? 
I see none. I will now close public hearings LU746. We will be laying over LU738, 742, and 746. So our business today is concluded. I would like to thank the council, land use staff for preparing today's hearing, and the members of the public and my colleagues for attending. This meeting is hereby adjourned.